they would have asked for direction. They would arrive on time. They would have helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and even bought practical gifts. Alright? Yeah. Only one more thing. That's my wife. Thanks for that. You see, Jesus is the gift of hope. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air. The Spirit is now at work in those who are disobedient. We were without hope, without trust. And this Christmas, whatever our financial situation, or whatever you wanted to get for Christmas as a gift and you didn't get it. Or whatever the problems are, we are in Christ that we can have hope. You see, the wise men may concern and hope with how would they find Jesus Christ. So this Christmas, let me ask you the question. How would you respond to God's gift of hope? Well, some people will have a half-hearted response to this Christmas. Some people in Queenstown, Kamani, will say, What, well, Jesus? Well, you can have your Jesus. You can take him. Leave me alone. I don't want to have him in my life. They refuse technology's power and presence in their lives. You see, that's what happened to the priests and the religious leaders over 2,000 years ago. Do you realize that those leaders lived literally a few kilometers away from the birthplace of Jesus? Bethlehem is not even 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem. And yet, they ignored what the scripture said about Jesus. Matthew 2 verse 3 says, When King Herod heard this, he was struck, disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was going to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophets have written. A half-hearted response in complacency and indifference. You see, the opposite to of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And when we are indifferent, we make Jesus one of the many options in our lives. I want you to try and remember these things that I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to unpack them a little bit. I believe today we work at our play, we worship our work, and we play at our worship. Listen again. We work at our play. We worship our work and we play at our worship. Let's look at it one, one thing at a time. We work at our play. Isn't it interesting today how much money and time and effort and energy we put into just playing? Whatever it is, whatever hobby it is, whatever sport it is, how much time we put into that play? We work and that's really, really hard. And please, I'm not knocking anyone who has hobbies or is a gym fanatic or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to have a balance. And some people, especially in the bigger cities, that's all they do. That's all they do. Secondly, we worship our work. Most of us want the most important thing in our life. If we say it's our careers and our jobs, our positions, our salaries, the kind of car that we drive. It's the most important thing for us and we worship that, don't we? It's very important. Yet again, there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to acquire the right balance. And lastly, we play in our worship. We make our worship of our Lord Jesus Christ optional. You know what we mean saying, God, I love you and I will worship you unless my turns of sports or unless I can uh, 
have an opportunity to go out of town and God, I love you and I will put you first unless something else comes up. A half-hearted response concludes that Jesus was a good man, a great teacher and leader, but not someone that I will give my time to do. So this Christmas, even in our area, some people will be indifferent to Jesus. They will say, I can take him or leave him. That's a memory make a difference to you. Some people on the Christmas will respond by opposing Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 verse 7 says that Herod all the man died secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to oppose Jesus. He was jealous of Jesus and he wanted Jesus to be dead. He wanted to kill him because he wanted no one in his kingdom to take priority over himself. He was worried of his popularity. You see, to oppose is to allow other things to take first priority. In fact, the Bible says you're either for Christ or against Christ. You can't have both ways. And if we're not careful, even as Christians, at Christmas time, we can allow other things to take priority over Jesus Christ. In a survey once done, they asked people, what is the most important thing about Christmas? And this survey was done for, to, to people who confess to be Christians. Do you know what the number one answer was? It wasn't coming together to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. For most people who profess to be Christians, was about getting all of the family together. The second thing, was that it was a time of hanging out with friends. Some even said that it was a time to have a great big meal. All those things are right. But what is the real meaning of Christmas? In the beginning of Advent, I challenged my congregation and many other congregations were challenged. Because we as ministers in this time are challenged by the Holy Spirit. That sometime in the time of Edward, if you've got children, if you've got grandchildren, read the story of the birth of Jesus as it is found in the Gospel. Don't just watch all these beautiful movies on Netflix and all that. Watch them, but read to your kids, grandchildren, or family that account of Jesus as it is in the Gospel. You see, all these things, if we are not careful, can take priority over putting Jesus in our lives first. And I think it's easy at Christmas to allow others, other things, to push Jesus aside. And if we're not careful, we can miss the reason for this season. And that is to celebrate the greatest gift of hope to the world. During Christmas, others will pursue Jesus at Christmas time. The man died, did that. And in Matthew chapter 2 verse 9 it says, After they heard the king, they went on the way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. You see, for months, years, the wise men pursued Jesus. They said, let us go after, let's find him, let's seek him, after him. Wise men still seek Jesus today. What are different ways that people are going to try and look for Jesus today? Where some people are going to try and believe in salvation by heritage. In other words, I believe that I'm going to go to heaven because my mom had a great faith. Or my grandparents had a great faith and so on. And therefore, because they were Christians, it makes me a Christian. Well, you cannot go to heaven with your parents' faith, or anyone else's faith. 
and is believing salvation by sincerity. People at Christmas will say that anyone can go to heaven as long as you are sincere. Look at some people in the world who are really, really sincere. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one gets to God except for me. He didn't say how sincere you are or not. Others will say that you can get salvation by subtraction. I can give up all my bad habits and then I can go to heaven. But Christianity is not what we are against, but Christianity is rather what we are for. How are we different? How do we reflect the love of Jesus to those around us? Others, Christmas, will believe in salvation by congregation. I will just become religious and go to church. Going to church with other believers is needed. We need community. But going to church will not save you, is it? And yet others of a Christmas will believe in salvation by works. I will earn my way to heaven, they will say. And if you stop and look at any religious, any other religions, it is about that, isn't it? Salvation by works. But Christianity is not. It doesn't matter how much good you go to do. Jesus doesn't look at the outward, but looks at the inward. And he looks at your heart, and he wants to change your heart. All of these ways are the wrong ways to try and find Jesus. And we come to Jesus by faith. Salvation is a gift from God that is available to anyone who will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, the word faith, trust, and believe all come from the same Greek word. Faith, faith is an action word, isn't it? It's not just a, a mental thought or a nice feeling. Faith involves both repentance and baptism. It's a complete turnaround. You were going in one direction, and now you're going in another direction, in God's direction. It's getting up every day, not asking, what must I do? But rather asking, Lord, what do you want to do through me? How can I make a difference to glorify your name? Once we pursue Jesus, you must accept him and embrace him. The wise men pursued Jesus until they found him. They bowed down and worshipped him and presented him with gifts. Now, if we are not careful, the utility scene that most of us know does not actually portray the story of the birth of Jesus accurately. Almost every nativity scene, whether it is a nativity scene or a nativity scene, have wise men in it. Am I right? A question. Were the wise men there the day Jesus was born? No. The answer is no. And we know that because they came approximately two years later. Because that is when Herod gives the situation in Bethlehem to kill all the boys two years of age. Because that was the span of when Jesus was born. So the wise men were not there when Jesus was born. They came much later. Another question. How many wise men were there? Well, we all say, obviously, three. Mm -hmm. They bought gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense. He doesn't say there were three. They bought three gifts. It says,
says that both be gifts, but it didn't say Jesus, that we might have at Christmas. Listen to what the scripture says. On coming to the house, here it is. They didn't come to the nativity scene. They didn't come to the manger. Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they came to the house several months later. They saw the child with his mother Mary and the bark down and worship him. They opened the treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, princes, and men. And look, you see, the wise men realized that Jesus truly was the king and the Messiah that they had been looking for. Jesus was and is the only hope of the world. He's the life of those living in darkness. He's the joy for those living in sorrow and despair. He is peace for those living in confusion. He is hope for those living in desperation. God knew our greatest need for forgiveness and He sent Jesus as a Savior. Today, in the time of Matthew, the Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This Christmas, make sure that you find Jesus. When you find Him, receive Him and worship Him. And we do that by making sure that Jesus is in the center of everything. Because Jesus is the only hope we have. He's the only hope we, we need. Our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in ESCOM. Our hope is not in system. But in Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ in our homes? We can complain about taking prayer out of schools or whether Christianity is recognized as a religion or not. We can complain, but the question is not about prayers in school, but prayers in your home, isn't it? Prayers in your hearts. Whose job is it to train the child in the way of the Lord? The teachers or the parents? I'm not getting any amen here, eh? must be wrong when the street is prepared. You know what? So it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. The song we sometimes sing is, my hope is filled on nothing else but Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Remember last Sunday, for those who were here last Sunday, we spoke about the rock on which the church was built and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But Christ the solid rock has stayed. And everything else, everything else, is sinking sand. Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of this country. Jesus is the hope for Queenstown Command. Jesus is the hope for our homes. Jesus Christ is your hope. And that's why at Christmas it's about God with us. Emmanuel. And because of that, you should, we should, I should never be the same. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas. And I want you to do something as we go to go into our, our last uh, carol together. But before that, you can see that the way it came in our decorator today was that in the city is many are Jesus and Crib. And there are crackers lying around. And I want you to come and receive. I want you to come and get a cracker. I don't know what's in the crackers. I didn't do the crackers. But I know what's on the cracker. It says Emmanuel. And it's a reminder to you that as you come in and receive, 
you receive a gift and then it's God with you. Take Emmanuel with you out of that. Take him into the remainder of 2019 and to the whole of 2020. Make Emmanuel the center of who you are in 2020. In your life, in your job, in your relationships, in your school, in your varsities, in your work, if you're starting a new work, make him your center. Because without him, he is not. So I want you to, uh, maybe our, our, our organist can just play something, just play something in the background. And uh, if you can come and just receive, take one for yourself. You have, you have plenty here. Please come and receive. Thank you. 